In this video, we're going to talk some more about William Wordsworth's poem, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. And this time we're going to take the angle of eco-criticism. So another kind of literary theory that I'd like to introduce you to. This is a very broad introduction, but it'll, it'll just give you a few of the basics. And it'll give you a sense of how each new critical theory sheds, some, uh, sheds a different kind of light on the same topic or the same text. And I think that's really worthwhile to see how... Uh, each theory brings out details that we might not have noticed otherwise. So what is eco-criticism? Well, it's a kind of literary theory that really came into being or, or became popular in the 1990s and is still so today. So we'll say the 1990s till today. There was some eco-criticism before that already, but as people started to think more and more about climate change and so on, uh, eco-criticism became a more urgent discipline or a more urgent field within literary studies. Now we're focusing especially on the relationship between literature and nature, but eco-criticism has moved beyond this as well, and there's lots of eco-criticism in other disciplines and other fields. What does eco-criticism focus on in terms of this relationship? Well, it's really wide open. So as, as long as you can find a text that has some bearing on nature, uh, you can practice eco-criticism, and you can ask very fundamental questions about how does this text approach nature? How does it view it? What can we learn from it? Uh, but there's definitely a side of eco-criticism that's, that's driven towards action and politics. So there's a side that's concerned with turning all of this literary theory into some kind of action so that we can think about uh, how to be, how to have um, sustainability, uh, how to ha have ethical behavior, uh, political change, and all of these kinds of things. So this side we might refer to as action as well as ethics. There's a lot of concern about proper ethics. Another side of eco-criticism concerns the very question of what is nature. So the concept of nature is being discussed. So nature, what is it? And you can take this in many different directions. So you might say, uh, for instance, a society will have a hierarchy or a structure, and that hierarchy will seem natural, um, at least to the people in that society. But from a distance, it may seem rather artificial. And so the whole concept of nature is being called into question. Uh, another place where you might see this is with something like gender. What does natural gender actually mean? Uh, and so eco-criticism, even though it focuses on nature, it of often also kind of moves into these other fields, such as society and human behavior. Um, less controversial is simply the appreciation of nature. So if we are busy with eco-criticism, then we can also come to appreciate nature uh, through literature, let's say. And that, again, might move us to action, might you know, make us plant some trees, grow a garden, uh, be involved, recycle, you know, all of these kinds of things. So that's roughly what eco-criticism does, at least you know some significant portions of it. Uh, but if you practice this kind of criticism, you should really feel free to take it in, in interesting uh, directions that, that you're fascinated by. So what I thought we would do, uh, having explained very broadly what eco-criticism is, is to actually have a look at a sample eco-critical reading of Wordsworth's poem, uh, I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud. And for this, I've selected this little article by Scott Hess, and it's called John Clare, William Wordsworth, and the Unframing of Nature. So here's a quotation from uh, the article, and uh, Hess is talking here about I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, and he says the narrator, which would be Wordsworth, I suppose, composes the landscape into aesthetic form from a single point located outside that landscape, exactly in the manner of a picturesque viewer, and in the process constructs a purely visual and seemingly disembodied subjectivity. Even as he claims to connect to nature, he views that nature through a kind of invisible frame and turns it into a resource for the construction of his own seemingly autonomous self. So what does that mean? 
Well, imagine that Wordsworth is like a tourist, and he goes and he, he looks at these daffodils, right? And it's almost as if he sees the daffodils just as a photo. Okay, so a bit like a postcard, you might say. And we know these kinds of tourists, right? They, they drive through, they stop, they take a picture, and they move on. Um, what Wordsworth does then is he, he composes this kind of scene as if it's one picture, as if it doesn't have movement beyond that. And you can imagine all the details in the scene. We have the lake, uh, we have all these little flowers, right? And then we have the larger trees, and the flowers are underneath, and then we have some clouds. There we go. And he is looking at the scene as if from a cloud, so quite far away. And this notion of distance is important, according to Scott Hess. So the point then, what, what Scott Hess is saying is that what Wordsworth does is he does not stick around, he doesn't immerse himself in nature, uh, he doesn't, you know, do anything in terms of um, sustainability, uh, he doesn't get a shovel out, he doesn't pick up garbage, none of this. I mean, he just looks from a distance, almost as if he takes a picture, then he leaves, and he's happy just to have that photo in his scrapbook, you might say. And the worst part of it is that he turns it into a resource for the construction of his own autonomous self. And what that means is that Wordsworth seems most interested in this picture uh, in order to think about his own subjectivity, his own consciousness. Because in the last stanza of the poem, of course, Wordsworth kind of says, well, uh, you know, I remember this scene. It comes back, it flashes uh, upon my inner eye and so on. Uh, and I have this wonderful sense of memory and imagination. So according to Hess then, Wordsworth does two things. First, he treats the scene just as a picture and you can take it with you and you can frame it, right? This notion of framing is important. And then the second thing is he uses it for purely selfish reasons uh, so that he can feel good about who he is and he can construct a sense of self. Now, as it turns out, though, Hess isn't quite done with those two criticisms, as if that's not enough. Uh, Hess also argues that we can apply this to today. We can actually think about this in relation to our own ethical or unethical practices in relation to the landscape. And the example that Hess gives is of the way in which North Americans often treat their national parks. So the North American landscape has lots of national parks, but according to Hess, what happens with these national parks is that we spend a tremendous amount of energy making those national parks as pristine as possible, as beautiful as possible, uh, keeping them clean, um, allowing tourists to kind of see nature uh, in its, its most beautiful form. But then we don't always do the same thing with the rest of the landscape. And according to Hess, what we do with the national parks is a little bit like what, we, what, what Wordsworth does with framing the scene. He doesn't look at anything else, right? He, doesn't, he ignores all the, the, the human parts of the landscape. He even gets rid of his sister, actually, in the picture. It's just himself, all lonely there. Um, and he creates this little pristine version of nature, which he doesn't get involved with. And maybe that's a little bit like the way we treat the national parks. So an example here is if you, if you go to Yellowstone, let's say. Uh, this is not his example, but I'll, I'll provide this one. Uh, most people go to Yellowstone and they want to see Old Faithful, right? They, they want to see it going up in, in all the steam and so on. Uh, and it's a remarkable sight. And then they take their picture and they go home. A little bit like what Wordsworth does. If you were to zoom out from this scene, I mean, this is sort of what you would see, right? You would see all these throngs of tourists wanting to go uh, see the Geisher. Which version of nature is correct? What should a poet describe? Uh, should a poet kind of zoom out and show the whole picture? Uh, should we talk about the way in which nature is being, uh, you know, maybe preserved in one place but destroyed in another? Those are all kinds of ethical questions. And according to Hess, uh, Wordsworth is not being quite ethical enough. Uh, he's just kind of using nature for his own ends. So that's one eco-critical perspective. And I think as you, as you look at that, you really have to decide for yourself, is that fair? Right? Do you agree with that? Uh, because there are other perspectives. And I'll, I'll mention one other one, which clashes a little bit with what Scott Hess is saying. So here is one more critical perspective. Uh, this is by Ralph Pite. 
Uh, he doesn't actually say that he's directly doing a eco-critical reading necessarily, but uh, he is talking about Wordsworth's concept of nature, and I think that that does put it into the same kind of field, this, some of the same interests as what other eco-critical uh, critics have. So here's just a little quote from his his article, and he writes in Wordsworth uh, words sorry in Wordsworth's work the tongue twister. The natural world is always social, both in itself and in its relation to man. Consequently, nature does not offer an escape from other people so much as express an alternative mode of relating to them. And I want to bring this up because notice that it talks about nature as being social. That's interesting because that suggests that Wordsworth does not see nature as alien and distant quite so much, but he sees a kind of companionship in nature. He sees a kinship. And that allows him then to immerse himself much more in nature than perhaps uh, Scott Hess actually suggests. And if you were to read these two critics side by side, and this is what I suggest you do as, uh, as an English student, uh, is that you read the critics as having a discussion, even when they don't mention each other, uh, then maybe you can take a stance on this and try to figure out, well, which one is closer to the truth. If we look at the poem then, right, I wandered lonely as a cloud, is it distant or is it not quite so distant? Uh, he does talk about nature as, as a jocund company, right, the sense of nature being happy and he finds happiness in nature. Um, even at the end, he says, my heart dances with the daffodils. So at the very least, we can say that this poem allows us to appreciate nature, and that might make us kind of go out into nature and conserve, conserve it. So I think you could argue that Scott Hess is being a bit too dramatic in suggesting that Wordsworth is being selfish. Um, it's quite possible that Wordsworth would go out on a Saturday and, you know, clean up garbage and, and look after things with, with other people. Uh, I don't think we have to make Wordsworth out to be a bad guy just for writing a poem that seems a little bit selfish. There's more to the picture, and I think we have to really look across Wordsworth's work to see uh, what his general attitude towards nature is. But I hope at least that you've been able to see how different perspectives can bring out details of the poem that we might not have noticed otherwise. And I think for that, eco-critic eco-criticism is very worthwhile and of course also it, it probably creates in us a desire to do something ourselves uh, to take care of the world in which we live and that is definitely a noble goal.